know, when somebody tells you you can't do something, that always motivates you to do more. Right. You know? I had a lot of people telling me that I wasn't going to succeed at um, at fly fishing and opening up a shop, and I just, you know, I had to prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that I love that when somebody tells me something like that, I'm like, oh, okay, we'll see about that. I'm the I'm, I'm with that with anything really. You know, I like to I like to create stuff and and uh, make make it succeed for sure. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is TomRollandPodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRollandPodcast.com, and the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram, or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. Hey, this is Guy Jeans, and I'm with the Kern River Fly Shop, and you're listening to the Tom Roland Podcast. Guy Jeans, how's it going, man? It's going good. Stoked to be on your show, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You know, we've it's it's funny that um i don't know if we've met in person or not if we have it's been quite some time but we run in a lot of the same circles we have a lot of the same friends we've been to a lot of the same shows and things like that it's funny how you can spend a lot of time around a certain area and then not meet certain people like yourself yeah i know i i know you're into uh you know you've been in the past in competition and whatnot and and same with me, and I don't think we've ever run into each other that way. No, uh -huh. you you know it's it's interesting because when I was reading your bio and things like that, um, you know, in, in this in this sport of of fishing, it you know it's a lifetime pursuit. You can do all kinds of things, and when you get into the competitive world of it, you can start getting into different little nuances of the competition and different different styles of fishing and stuff like that. And I guess. Um, I started down the, the road that you, that you ended up on with the competitive fly fishing. I did the, uh, ESP and great, great outdoor games a couple times. And then, then from there, I just kind of went to saltwater and I knew about the U S team USA and it was interesting to me, but yeah. I just started spending less and less time out West and more and more time in Key West, which is different from you and, and my friend Pete Erickson, which I know that you, uh, competed with. Tell me about, um, yeah. well, well, first of all, uh, I'd love to know about just Kern river fly shop and what, what you got going on there, because it seems really interesting. And I don't know about the Kern river. I'm not a California guy. I spent very little time yeah. out there, but it just seems like you've got an interesting mix of kind of warm water and, and cool water fishing. Um, that's perfect for fly fishing. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, about uh it's, well it's been 20 years now and um you know i i admire you as far as being an entrepreneur as well that's exactly what what i am as well and um you know i i was a musician for many years uh playing in a ska band which um I'm still playing a little bit here and there having fun called the stone flies and um and we were my music career was kind of taking a little different turn and whatnot and i'm like okay now what am i going to do and so um i grew up in ventura and um 
there's this river up uh, about three hours from Ventura called the Kern River. And you know, a buddy of mine said, hey, man, you got to go check out this river called the Kern River, which I had never been to. And I drove up uh, and basically fell in love with the place and um, fished it for many years. And it just is a really intriguing river. It has a variety of species you can catch. Um, and then I decided, hey, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, start a start a fly shop. <laughs> and uh, I just went for it and I uh, just had this tunnel vision. You know, people were telling me, oh, you shouldn't do it. You, you, you know, you're going to lose your ass and all this kind of stuff. And I was just like, just didn't listen. Yeah. And we said uh, I was I was playing these piano gigs in Ventura where I was playing uh, basically jazz piano with a saxophone player. And then I would drive up to the Kern three hours away and I would guide, sleep in the back of my truck. And then drive home after a couple of days of guiding. And then after a while, I go, man, I, I might be able to pull this off, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, one day I was, I was driving um, back from guiding and there's a building in, in Kernville where um, there was a for rent sign on the, on the, on the door. And I went and looked inside and it was this, this thrift store for about 30 years or something. And, uh, so I, I called the number and um, the, the people said, oh yeah, the, the, the lady who's had it for 30 years isn't gonna um, use it anymore. And they didn't wanna rent. I said, I wanted to open up a fly shop and they're all, what's that? And they had no idea what fly fishing was or anything. There was no fly shop in the town of Kernville. And um, I said, hey, can I come over to your house? And um, I wanna show you some. And I basically did this sales presentation on fly fishing, brought over bugs and the stone flies and may flies all in these little vials and showed them exactly, you know, what I do and this and that and basically did the sales pitch on, you know, fly fishing and opening up a fly shop. And a couple of weeks later, they, they gave me the, the, the rental. Huh. It took me about a, took me about a year um, to get the, the business or the, the, you know, get stuff in the shop, you know, yeah. hardly any or whatever. And I did it and um, opened up uh, 20 years ago. And it's been a, been a, a really cool ride since, uh, since then. Met some of my best friends, um, fly fishing, and it's just been, it's been really cool. Um, the fly shop is, uh, it's not a giant fly shop or anything like that. It's just a small fly shop. But um, we have uh, some guides that work for me now, and uh, they're doing real well. And we guide the, the upper Kern, which is, is uh, about 150 miles long. Basically, the whole Kern River is about 150 miles long. And there's one that's called uh, right above our town here it's in Kernville. It goes up about 70 miles, and that's called the Upper Kern. Okay. And, um, what we're famous for is the Kern River Rainbow, which is a native species of California. And, of course, uh, the California State Freshwater Fish, which is the golden trout. Okay. And so people come from all over the place to catch one of those. Um, now the golden and trout are they in the river? They are. They're in the South Fork of the Kern. Okay. And which is another uh, little piece to our little puzzle here. We have um, we have the South Fork of the Kern, which has goldens and browns in it. Then we have the North Fork, which has uh, rainbows and browns. And then we have the Lower Kern, which has smallmouth and largemouth and trout. Smallmouth being my favorite. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we also have Lake Isabella with, uh, we have a, an amazing carp uh, fly fishery as well. We just had a big giant carp fly fishing tournament on this last Saturday. Boy, that's really all taken the, off, hasn't it? The carp fishing. Yeah, all, all, all the carpers come out of the closet, come over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the carp, you know, the carp is, it fights harder than any of the other fish that you, that you mentioned. It yeah. uh, is incredibly popular in England and uh, in, in, in Europe. Um, my sister lives over there. She sent me some angling magazines, like angling times and stuff. And it's, I thought it was a joke. Like it was all carp. Everything was carp and, um, yeah. they, they're really into it. They can be really, really hard to catch. And, and, um, you know, they haven't been quite embraced in the United States, like, like over there, but I don't know. I mean, they fight harder than anything else. They're very similar to redfish. Uh, in the way that yeah. they feed and, and people love redfish, but you know, they don't like carp for some reason. I don't know. I like anything, I, anything that bites. Exactly. I'm, I'm with you on that, man. Um, it was funny. I, I just went to Mexico and, uh, went fishing for permit and bonefish, you 
you know, all, all the species that you target a lot of the time, which was a blast. But I, um, the, the bonefish uh, were actually really easy to catch. They were really uh, on the chew and whatnot, but it, it was very similar as well. Um, and I tell people when I got back, I go, if you guys can catch a carp, you have no problem catching a bonefish. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, uh, it, carp are super difficult. <laughs> yeah. So in your cool. area, how do you, how do you fish for them? What are, what are the, what type of carp? I mean, there's a lot of different types of carp, um, and, and they eat different things and they eat different things in different parts of the country. How do you fish for them and what are they eating primarily? Yeah. So, um, we have the common carp and um we fish uh they do a bunch of different things they mud and they tail mm -hmm. but they um, they also will eat on the surface here so we have a uh, grasshopper hatch and ants and um, beetles and stuff so they will eat on the surface so that's a lot of fun when they're doing that um, they get kind of blown into the lake and um but this last uh, weekend they were uh they were mudding and tailing and so we have flies that we've developed um one's called the carpalicious that has a little red tail that sticks up and um it's a great fly um for when they're mudding and tailing and they uh they really like that fly so yeah um using a basically like a six weight um using uh 2x and and that sort of thing um so uh <laughs> um yeah we uh we uh we have a blast fishing for them for that's sure. cool you know i have a, a funny love affair with the carp because when i was a kid we used to, my parents used to take me to this cheap little amusement park and, um, it was called Lake Winnipesoka and we knew the people that, that ran the park and they would give us free popcorn. And there was this one little corner of this lake that it was on and everybody would feed the carp popcorn and these carp got as big as your leg. I mean, they were eating popcorn every day. And yeah. they just sat there and, you know, people would just feed them popcorn. And when they, I'm sure that when they finished for the day, they poured all the popcorn into the lake every single oh, yeah. day. And so these carp are just eating whatever they normally eat. Plus this calories of popcorn, like massive yeah. amounts of popcorn. And they got huge. And I always wanted to catch one. And I just, people said, ah, oh, you don't want to catch one of those. And I'm like, yes, yeah, I do. That's the biggest fish I've ever seen in my life. That looks like it would be a lot of fun to, to catch that fish and, uh, never, never did, but always wanted to. And then yeah. later, you know, there've been some books written on carp fishing and it's become more, um, uh, more popular and lots of people are way into it. Um, and, and they can be very difficult to catch. I know that, but that's a, that's a great species. I know that a lot of the Rocky mountain guides, when it gets a little, little warm, they go to the lower reaches of the, of the different rivers and, and start to catch the carp as well. Take a break from the, from the trout and a lot of times the customer that's been going out there with them for 20 years and like why haven't we ever done this before this is great yeah <laughs> you know we've uh we've done a really cool uh cultural change here where people are actually targeting them we're guiding for them now and it's a lot of fun you know what's neat about lake isabella is the the lake will get real low through the season and then right about now we start getting the snow runoff and so they start filling up the lake again and it fills in, we call them the flats, the Isabella flats. So you're fishing in like, you know, knee deep water and there's just, you know, thousands of carp everywhere. Wow. So it makes it really cool. Well, and, and a good day, like on that stretch of water, you know, is it catching a fish? Is it catching 20 fish? Is what, what is a good day? So uh, yesterday I just went out for about an hour and a half and I caught, you know, five or six. Hmm. And, uh, but it also depends on the angler, right? you know, and, and the casting and that Yeah, but a good thing. angler, you know, you can, I mean, yeah. you know, there's a lot of different types of fishing, like permit fishing. You can take the best angler in the world. You catch one, that's a fantastic day, no matter what, you know, some days right. you might catch three, but some weeks you might go blank, you know, even with somebody yeah. that's fantastic. And then the next guy shows up and can't cast yeah. to the end of his shoelaces and catches three, you know, and it's just right. weird kind of deal. But I always kind of like to, you know, set the expectation of what I'm getting ready to go for. Just kind of like what, what would be a great day? Would it be if we caught one? Is it where we caught 20? I mean, like, is, is it an action yeah. fish? Is this a, is this a, you know, a one, one is fantastic kind of thing. It sounds like, you know, if you had a good angler out there, you could catch a dozen fish probably in a, in a day we had, we had at the carp uh, we call it carp fest 
and we had um, some people that had never caught a carp, and uh, they all caught a couple. So that was yeah. kind of cool. So nice. like the teams are the teams are like two person teams, and you got to catch your five best. And most teams caught five. You know, each person caught caught five. So and it's based on inches or or what? Yeah, it, yeah, inches. Nice. Yeah, you got to come out and do it, man. I'd love to. Well, I would. I would love to do that just for for. I mean, the carp sounds cool, but um, I just don't know California well as far as a, a, a fishing in California. And uh, yeah. I had some friends that were down around San Francisco, and they were telling me how fantastic it was. I used to work with some different people down there, and um, there's some great fishing. You know, I mean, in California. Uh, you know, you have so many different types of fishing. You can go saltwater, you can go freshwater, you can go sturgeon fishing, you can go bass, largemouth bass fishing, some of the best largemouth bass fishing in that delta, and smallmouth yes. bass fishing, and all the trout. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful place to fish, and I don't know it. I mean, it's one of the, it's probably one of the states that I've spent the least amount of time in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So, go ahead. Well, I was going to, I was just going to, um, change the subject, but tell me what the interesting thing is before we move on. Oh, the, uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, California has, uh, 10 native trout, hmm. you know, from California and, um, the, our fish and wildlife here, the California department of fish and wildlife, if you catch six of those 10 native trout, it's called the heritage trout program. Uh, they'll give you Joseph Tomarelli's, uh, prints, which is pretty famous artists and it'll have your name and that sort of thing. Oh, so nice. it's really pop, really popular around our area because you can get three of them done. We got the golden trout, of course, the Kern River Rainbow, and then another one called the Little Kern Golden, which is another species. And then you got to travel around the rest of the state to catch them. You know, the Lahontan Cutthroat, the Coastal Rainbow, the McLeod River Rainbow, all these different species all up and down the the uh, the state. It's kind of cool to get all ten. That's, yeah, that's wild, man. Ten ten yeah. trout species. That's, that's yeah, isn't it crazy? That's a lot. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting when you have when you have certain fish that live only in like you you're saying that Kern River Rainbow is 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 specific just to that little region and maybe even that little drainage. What's special about that fish? What is different about it? Um, well, it it can get pretty good size up in the upper stretches. You know, um, it starts up by Mount Whitney to kind of give you your bearings, and then it flows south through Sequoia National Park, and then it goes through the Golden Trout Wilderness. And then it flows into the Sequoia National Forest um, down here to Kernville. And uh, up in the upper stretches, it's managed um, as a wild trout fishery. So there's like 50 miles of wild trout waters, um, catch and release mm. um, fish. You know, you can catch, go into this pristine area, hike into this pristine area and catch these, you know, really nice uh, mm. trout back there. Um, they say that, you know, Rainbows put all over the world were either from uh, the Kern River or the McLeod River. Oh, really? Which is kind of, yeah. Oh. So you'll, you'll you'll have that little uh, history there for you too. That's pretty cool. That's pretty yeah. cool. So where I was getting ready to go was was the the world of competitive uh, fly yeah. fishing, which is which is interesting, and we've delved into it on this podcast before with some different people, and and just it's just a whole different world. I'm curious to know how you got into that world. Um, someone had told me, um, way back, I think it was like 2005, um, that they were going to start, um, doing competitions all over the U S to kind of get a team together, um, for, uh, fly fishing UST, USA team. And, um, they decided to have a Western regional on the Kings river, which is, uh, about three hours from the Kern river, mm -hmm. which is a little bit North of us. And, uh, so I, uh, I signed up, I think Jack Dennis was the coach back then. That's how I met him and, um, the Jackson hole yeah, crew, probably Jeff whole... Courier and Carter Andrews and all those guys that were, there was a whole crew from Jackson hole that came <laughs> out, out yeah. west here. And, uh, and they held the, uh, they held it on the Kings and that was my first, uh, entry into a uh, competition and, you know, learn, learning, I learned so much. Um, uh, they actually had some classes for some of the anglers and that were put on by a guy named Vladi, mm. who's a real good um, European nymphor, Polish uh, nymphor. He's a, like the world champion for many years. Um, but he kind of taught the the U.S. guys a little bit here and there. And, and eventually, um, 
uh, we all started kind of fishing that way and, and doing real, doing real well in the competition. What was the first thing that you noticed when you get to this, when, when you get to the, the competition? Um, what was the first kind of big learning thing that opened up a whole new universe? Was it Euro nymphing? Was it, what, what was it? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was the Euro nymphing. Um, and, uh, you know, just getting to know, you know, looking at your beat in a different way. Um, you know, you, you got to draw for a certain section of, of river and, you know, you may have, you know, pocket water, you may have a big giant frog water in between, you know, your fishing water and you got to figure out, you know, what you're going to do in that situation. Hmm. Um, you have your rods set up at different, different areas of your beat. You know, you may have a, a rod with a streamer set up one with a dry, uh, dry fly set up if you need it, or and one with a nymphing rig. So you have all these different setups going on. Um, I didn't realize how physical it was, hmm. you know, the running up and down the banks and, you know, just being in physical, good physical condition, you know, just um, not only your balance, but also your, you know, uh, your just being able to breathe and, you know, just being able to physically pull it off. That was a big deal for hmm. sure. And so why are you running up and down the bank? Because you're on a time limit and, and yeah. you, yeah. So, yeah, you're on a time limit, you know, you get three hours to fish a, uh, a beat and you got, you know, you got your, um, you know, you got four fish or something, you know, and, you know, if you can get one more, oh my God, I'm in the running or whatever, you know, and, and you, just beat, you beat the water in front of you to death. So now you got to run yeah. down to the beginning yeah. and, and try that run through the frog yeah. water and get down to the beginning. And maybe you got a chance of catching something again. Yeah. The, the stoke too, when you catch a fish, you know, when you, when you do catch a fish, you know, the first one in your heat, you know, you're just like, you know, super stoked and having fun. And I, I really enjoyed it actually. And, and meeting all the different guys from all over the U S too, you know, mm -hmm. made some, um, from people all over the place, other guides, um, that sort of thing and learning from them, you know, like a lot of the times when we're, when we're done with the beat, we'll, we'll actually talk, you know, what were you using? What, what X were you using? What were you doing? Oh, what were you using? Oh yeah. I didn't even think about that. Oh, cool. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, That's what's so awesome about fishing generally is that, man, you can feel like you are doing everything that you possibly can. And then you talk to somebody who may be a great angler or maybe a beginner angler or somewhere in between. And they're like, Oh, well, I was just using a grasshopper. And you're like a grasshopper. <laughs> didn't even yeah. think about that. And then yeah. you try it and it's like, well, I thought that kid that has been fishing for a year didn't know anything. Turns out he was using the only fly that he owned and it worked great. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's like the white belt mentality. You can learn from everybody and you should continue to, because just because somebody hadn't been doing it very long, doesn't mean that they're not trying something that is so far outside of what you think would work. You're on, you know, eight X and size 24s and he's throwing, you know, basically the fly line, plus four inches of leader and a grasshopper and they're crushing it and you're there's yeah. no possible way that could work you know but it does sometimes and i don't know sure. you just learn those things but I'm curious because euro nymphing has has um has taken some evolutions and they've gotten it's gotten better and more refined and and in america now we're making you know rods specific to certain techniques and certain things and when you started what this is like what 15 years ago 20 years ago that you were doing this yeah. so when yeah. when you're going the nymphing that you were doing like on the kern and in in the qualifications for this explain what you were normally doing and then let's 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 talk about what you saw the the europeans doing or vladi was showing you how to do or like what was the difference there well we were fishing under you know indicators you know, and, and dead drifting in competition, you can't use indicators, you can't use split shot. And, um, so we were doing, we of course did a lot of that. Um, we did high sticking, very kind of similar to it. Um, when you go into competition, you can't tie from the bend of the hook, you have to tie off a tag. Um, so there's a big difference there. So I personally you mean with a, think for that, a dropper. Yeah. For okay. a dropper, mm -hmm. uh, your leader, um, you, I, I personally think that's a better way to fish anyways, uh, now. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just a little bit different. Um, you know, with, uh, European nymphing, you're, there's so many different styles, but the way Vladi taught us was, you know, you pull the, the 
flies a little bit faster in the current downstream when you're when you're fishing. The other thing that was really interesting that made me a better guide um, back then was that you know realizing that the fish are like right right there, like right at the edge of your fly rod. Whereas a lot of people will walk right out into the river to that really nice spot that's right across the river, but they won't fish their way out um, mm -hmm. and, and hit the water on their way out. And there's fish right in front of you at your feet, basically. And um, so that, you know, created a really neat um, way to guide too and teaching people that the fish are actually right there, right at the end of your <laughs> fly rod. Yeah. And so a lot more people catching fish for sure. Yeah. And then you take those things that you learned in competition and, and bring them right back to your guiding and, and become a better guide. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. the, the amount of people that you're around when you're in those competitions, you know, these are, these are uh, some of the guys that are like best, you know, the best in the U S and you're, you're learning from them. They're learning from you and how you do things or whatever. And it's just a big, it's almost like a big giant guide round table, you know, where everybody's just talking about all this stuff. I think, I think the U S team has gotten better because of it. You know, everybody's mm -hmm. talking and figuring things out and that sort of thing yeah well then it becomes a team you know like we're trying now to compete with the checks or compete with yeah. someone a, another team and so you start to pool knowledge together which is an exponential learning process for for most people isn't it interesting how and this happens in the salt water too but there will be something that someone will think is i don't know shouldn't be allowed strike indicators. Yeah. And they'll say, okay, well, we're not going to allow strike indicators. And when you do that and you, you, you put that rule out to some really good fishermen who are going to catch fish one way or another, then this whole new style develops because of that. Like for example, yeah. if they had allowed strike indicators, maybe European nymphing would be a thing. Maybe it wouldn't like right. who knows? But it's also it's it's I just find it very interesting that when you look back through the the evolution of techniques, uh, both fresh saltwater, inshore, offshore, that that a lot of times it comes down to a rule that was in a tournament, like circle hooks, no circle hooks, use monofilament, use braided line. Uh, all of these things are either illegal in some tournaments or totally that the thing that you have to do in others, and that's what's interesting to it too, like yeah. chumming, no chumming. Um, all these different things. And so when you start getting into these tournaments that are like chum tournaments in the Florida Keys, if you think that you can go there and compete with these guys that chum by sight fishing, I mean, on rare, rare occasion, you're going to maybe catch as many fish as, as somebody that's chumming. But when it's a chumming tournament, there are these guys that that's what they do. Day in, day out. It doesn't matter if it's cloudy. It doesn't matter if it's blowing. In fact, it's better if it's blowing. And then it starts to develop this whole style of fishing. Now they can do it in deeper water than they've ever done it before. Now they start trying different areas to do it. And then you have a sight fishing guide that is just super competitive. And, and he's like, well, if they can do it over there, I know this place where there's tons of fish up on the flat that I see them all the time. And I'm going to try chumming off the edge of that flat. And then they yeah. come in with huge numbers. And nobody's ever done it there before because they didn't have any reason to, but it's, it's just kind of interesting to, to track back, um, certain techniques. And, and a lot of times it's, it's some sort of a, a competition or a tournament or even, even a law, like, you know, a barbless hook, right? Like that, that changes the way that you fight a fish. If you have to fish only barbless and, and maybe it improves the technique. Or maybe it doesn't. I don't know. It's just kind of interesting. And there's a lot yeah, of different things like that. Yeah. There's also in the competition, they do still water, you know, uh, fly fishing too. So that brings a whole nother interesting uh, thing to it as well. Just learning how to, to fish in still water. Now with yeah. your background and, and I mean, you have all those high lakes in the, in the, that's what I've always heard. Like I read Randall Kaufman's books when I was first getting started and there were like the high mountain lakes and going, catching the golden trout up there. And I was always just just thinking yeah. that would be so awesome to go backpacking up there. So you got all that. How did you yeah. stack up in the still water? Did you still have a lot to learn or, or did you do well always. in that portion of it or what? I did do well in that portion, but I was always learning, you know, um, you know, some of the nationals were in lakes that completely different than the lakes that I fish. And, um, 
you know, just using different sinking lines and trying to figure out the depth where the fish are at. You know, you're going into these lakes blind. You can't pre-fish them really. Mm -hmm. you know? And so you're going in, okay, where, what, what's going on here? Or you're just drifting, you know, they, they start at one end of the lake and you drift and you try to catch a fish, you know, Wow. Uh, and stuff like that. You know, they put a little, they put a little, uh, like a big giant bag behind the boat. So you don't go too fast. Mm -hmm. Sea anchor. Yeah, and it's just like this thing holding you as you're drifting across the lake, um, and you're you're fishing with another angler on the boat as well, and then there's a guy rowing, and so you can only fish a certain area of the boat from the middle of the boat to the right, middle of the boat to the left for one angler. And it's interesting, you know, just trying to figure that all out. So you're out there trying to figure out where are the fish, you know, hmm. uh, but it's fun, totally fun. So when did you decide that? maybe you weren't going to do the competitions anymore. You know, it's, um, it takes a, you know, a lot of time you're away from the family, um, you're away from the business, you know, I'm trying to run a business as well. So, um, that's kind of where I had to kind of draw the line. It's like, okay, you know, just pulling, pulling me away from my girls and hmm. my family. And so, um, I just kind of said, Oh, you know, I'm going to concentrate on the business and, and my family. Yeah. That's interesting. That's why I didn't, and that's why I stopped doing redfish tournaments almost exactly the same way. <laughs> you know, it's just like pulling you away and you're, you're, you're yeah. on the road and you're like, what am I doing here? This is, yeah. first yeah. of all, it's, I mean, I was so passionate about this for so long. And then all of a sudden you're like, this is not really what I want to be doing right now. I want to be home yeah. with my family. And yeah. when you encounter that, like, I don't care how tough you are, how motivated or driven you are, yeah. when it comes to your family and you're just like, Mm, I don't want to be here because I'd rather be there. That's a whole different yeah. deal than this is yeah. hard work. And I'm not sure that I am, am as interested in it as I used to be. You can push through that. But the family thing, man, when you're missing home and your wife's there and she's like struggling with the, with the kids and, and they're doing things that you want to be there for mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. to go home for me. I mean, I was, I just kept thinking this only happens once. You know, like yeah. my kids are only this age one time yeah. and, right. but that, you know, for, for me, that was the birth of the, the TV shows was, was, uh, yeah. getting, getting away from the tournaments. And I don't know, it seemed like a, it seemed like a, a, a step backwards at the time, but it turned out to be good. Um, so, and, and there's another interesting jump in your career where you're, you're a guide, you're sleeping in your truck, you're working really, really hard, and you decide that you want to open a fly shop, which to me, I've seen several other guides do that, um, sure. both in freshwater and in saltwater. And man, that seems hard to me. That seems really, really, really challenging to me um, because I have worked in a retail shop, uh, in a fly shop before. I know what goes into it. I know what the owner was doing when I left, you know, he's going through the books. He's making sure that he's got everything priced right. He's there's yeah. stuff that's not selling. You got tremendous amount of money in this stuff and it's not selling. You thought it was going to sell. And now you just yeah. sunk a bunch of your capital into this stuff. That's just sitting there. You pick the no, wrong. Tom, I, still I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just, it's just a, it just seems like that is 100% a full-time uh, job to no, be sure. a fly shop owner. So how do you, yeah. How do you do that? How do you how do you make that jump from from being a guide to being a fly shop owner, which probably soon after turns into an outfitter uh, running other guides? And maybe you were already doing that before. But what was the process like for you? Yeah, so um, you know, I was guiding for a long time by myself, and I hired hired guides to work as well, and and that sort of thing. Um, and then um, I then I started business kind of came down and, you know, with business, you go up and down, you know, mm -hmm. and weather the storm is like super important um, to be able to, to pull that off. So for me um, lately, what's really cool is I've got some great guides working for me. Um, super fishy, love the, love to the guide. They're not guiding, they're fishing, you know, those type of guys. Um, and so it's given me a little more free time to run a business. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, instead of guiding and coming, back to the shop and seeing all these phone calls and, Oh, I've got to order this, or I've got to do this. And oh, I've got to call this guy back. Oh my gosh. You know, it's, you're right. I was working many, many hours. 
now I can concentrate. I'm guiding a little bit for with clients that I I don't want to say I like, but you know that are good clients, mm -hmm. you know, and so um, that I've had for many years and that I enjoy being with. So picking picking and choosing a little bit on that with the with the uh, the clients, um, but now I'm able to concentrate more on the business, the behind the scenes, the marketing, the ordering, uh, just all that kind of stuff, and nice. focusing. Focusing more on my my fly fishing school, and um, doing a lot more of that stuff. I'm I'm traveling a little bit, doing uh, some saltwater uh, surf stuff in my hometown, up and down the California coast. You know, fly fishing in the surf. So I'm doing a lot of that, um, and casting classes up and down the state as well, and and that sort of thing. And I I enjoy that part of it. Um, but yeah, the you know having a fly shop. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to retire and I'm going to have a fly shop. In, it's, you know, it's a lot more than that, for sure. It's a, it's a retail business, managing people. Um, it's a lot of work, for sure. Well, it's certainly a lot more than that today. And this is another thing that I wanted to talk to you about, about what it's like to, to be running a fly shop, which is a very personal, hands-on kind of uh, in-person kind of thing. And you're doing that in the age of the internet. And not only are you doing that in the age of the internet, but you have survived the beginning of the internet to today which there's been lots of changes. And like probably when you first started the, the shop, you know, the, there used to be um, all of the, especially in the fly fishing world, there were, there were real boundaries set on how far dealers could be away from one another and how many dealers could be, you know, how many dealers could, could carry a line in a certain state or a certain area. And they were very, very, very protective of that. And, um, and then the internet came out and it's like, they tried to remain protective and then I don't know what has happened since then. It's like just free for all now, I guess. But, but what was that like? I mean, how, what, that's just seems like a, a an interesting journey to today. Yeah. You know, the, the internet competition is huge. You know, that some of these companies, uh, rod companies and manufacturer clothing lines and some of the bigger brands, they keep a pretty good rap on, you know, what people are selling there their products for in fact you know some some fly shops and some businesses have been you know stripped of their dealerships because they were undermining the the, mm -hmm. the retail the whatever and so uh um, yeah they, they keep a good wraps on that you know if you're if they are on your website and they see a price that's lower than it's supposed to be they'll call you up and say hey you need to change it back so it makes it fair for a lot of the folks out there you know which i think is great um, to sell to your customers, you know, right. instead of your somewhere else. So are you able to compete with, with just personal service and, and teaching people how to cast and, and sizing them in the right waiter and, you know, getting the right rod for them because of their casting style and what they're going to fish for and being able to ask questions. I mean, is that, it, it, are you still kind of battling the internet and, and, in that situation or, or do people understand that the personal service is worth the visit? The personal service is so huge in, um, our business. And when I first opened up the shop, I told myself that I was going to welcome everybody that comes in the shop with open arms. Like, you know, even if they're just beginning, they walk in the shop, they don't know anything. They're already intimidated on, you know, fly fishing in general. Um, so that's our, that's our approach when somebody walks into the shop and you can tell they're a little bit nervous to even ask a question, you know, we were real friendly. Hey, what's going on? How you doing? You fishing out there? Whatever. And um, it's sincere. You know, we want to get people into the sport of fly fishing. We don't have any secrets. We don't have any secret spots, you know, that, that sort of thing. We want people to go out there and have a good time, take their kids fishing, that sort of thing. So I think that's, a huge part of our success is customer service, um, friendly service, um, sharing knowledge, that sort of thing. Um, I think that's super important with the fly shop. Fly shops that I, before I opened up a fly shop, I went on a fly shop tour mm. and I, I went to all, all the fly shops I could in California. And of course I've been to other ones in the West and um, you know, there is a big difference in some of the fly shops that you walk into and personalities and how they treat people and that sort of thing. And for us, it's been that friendly, friendly service. And um, we do probably, 
I would say 90% of our business is beginners. Really? And uh, just getting people into the sport. Absolutely. Hands down. Just even guiding too. Just people coming up just to want to learn how to fly fish. Um, we have, you know, big uh, beginner fly fishing classes and, um, you know, two instructors in the classes with these people just wanting to learn about fly fishing. And we've also seen a big bump the last year right after COVID, you know, things just went through the roof um, as far as people wanting to get outside and get mm -hmm. outdoors. Our, our industry, the fly fishing industry was bumped up a, a ridiculous percent too, for sure. Did you see the, the numbers of licenses in California go way up? Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, we're still kind of behind the times in California when it comes to licenses, as far as, um, you know, they're trying to make it so that when you buy a license, it starts from that date for a year. Yeah. Um, they have an old school where you have to buy it, at, you know, January 1st, and then it doesn't matter if you buy it, you know, September, it's still the same price. Right. So they're dealing with that kind of stuff, you know, trying to get that figured out. So once they do that, I think they'll sell even more licenses. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the, the fly fishing industry is now in terms of uh, intimidation, lack of intimidation, bringing down the barriers of entry, like what you're, what you're talking about, you're, you're, you're taking a personal stance in saying that, you know, now 90% of your customers are, are beginners, but fly fishing is, I think a good use of the word notorious for, um, being somewhat, you know, um, I don't know what a good word is. Uh, it, it's a little bit intimidating. It's a, it's yeah. kind of intimidating. There's some personalities that, you know, you, you certainly run into. And if you don't know what, a <laughs> the difference between a size 20 and a size two, I don't have anything to do with you. Right. Like, okay, mm -hmm. well, how are you ever going to learn that? Like, I don't know. Where yeah. do you think, do you think it's gotten better? Do you think it's gotten worse? Do you think it's a case by case basis? What do you think? Um, you mean as far as fly shops doing yeah, that? Just, or? just, yeah, fly shops and just the overall fly fishing industry either being uh, reducing the barriers for entry or maintaining kind of the status quo of. I think, need, I, think it's you. Taken, I think it's taken a, uh, a route of, you know, you know, being friendly to people and getting people into the sport. I think there's a lot of people out there that are realizing, you know, that beginners are, are great customers. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's taken that route. Although there are some, some folks out there, you know, <laughs> I, always, I always joke around, you know, like some, some people uh, come in the shop, you know, and their, their egos are so big, they can't even fit through the door, you know, and I'm just like, come on, man. You know, it's like, really, you know, so um, we try to, you know, deflate those egos, you know, pretty quickly with, with friendly service and that sort of thing, but it's just fishing, man. It's just, it's just fishing. Let's have fun. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I think that the beginners, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely taken on where, where more people are, are getting into the sport. And I think people are more friendly. We have a, a really cool program here, uh, called a women's day mm. and we're, uh, we, the, the fly fishing club here, they're called the Southern Sierra Fly Fishers. And um, we had this gal uh, named Celine who started this Women's Day out here. And we every year we have like 60 women come up to the current and learn how to fly fish. It's amazing. And it's really cool. And, and so now I, I believe lots more women are getting into the sport. Mm -hmm, for sure. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's cool too. Yeah. I think, I don't know about you, but I mean, I've guided a lot of couples i've got a lot of women i've got a lot of men and typically about 98 percent of the time you have the dude that's really good and his wife who is kind of along for the ride and she outfishes him five to one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know well, and this guy's really been this guy's been around the world he's done everything he's caught you yeah. know he's got 20 world records and the next thing you know his wife catches the biggest fish of the trip every mm -hmm. time every time and, yeah. and just women in general, I mean, and girls, like I have two boys and a, and a, and a girl and you know, my daughter will catch the biggest fish most yeah. of the time. And, yeah. uh, she might not catch the most, but typically it's going to be, you know, I don't know what it is about women. And, and, and it seems like they are, um, 
more naturally inclined to being a good fisherman, but more naturally inclined to be intimidated about the sport. And I don't, I, I, I wonder if that's getting better. I don't know. I mean, you certainly have lots of companies um, who have embraced women coming into the sport and inviting women into the sport and making products for women to be in the sport. And, and, you know, I mean, that's a big one too. Like, you know, if yeah. you got to wear your, your, your granddad's old rubber waders and you know, they're 22 sizes too large. It's really not a very comfortable day where if you get a pair of nice stretch Gore-Tex waders that fit you properly and you've got the gear that, that fits you properly and it's not just hanging off of you and the sleeves aren't, you know, 12 inches too long. It's a much more enjoyable day. And I even go back, like people have asked me about like when I started guiding and I'm like, well, you know, it was kind of a magical time because I started before river runs through it. And then that movie came out and about that same time, the Gore-Tex waiter was invented and everybody was more comfortable. We had Gore-Tex jackets. We had Gore-Tex waders. We had more comfortable stuff. The rods got better. There was this influx of people. Like it was just this, this time where it was just all of a sudden more fun to fish because I mean, the boats got better. Drift boats became like, I mean, I started getting out of a John boat. Right. And then a couple of years later, you don't see a single John boat on the river. It's all drift boats and nice boats and comfortable seats and everything just got better in a very short period of time. And I think that's the same for women. Like when, when, when companies are making products specifically designed to fit women and they fit better and they're more comfortable, it's a more fun day, right? When you're wearing, like go out in a crappy rain jacket and tell me if you have a great time versus right. going out in a really good one that fits properly. And you're, you stay out there all day. It's no big deal. Right. But it's like, that's, sure. that's like taking a kid fishing, like make sure that the kid's comfortable. And if they're not comfortable, you can forget them ever coming back again. This was miserable. I don't know why you like doing this. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think women too, they just listen, you know, they just listen a little better. And uh, we, we know how to do everything already. So yeah, uh, that, you know, that, there's a story like this, this happened so many times as I, you know, take a couple out and the, the guy would be like, Oh, just hang with her, man. And, um, I'll fish the river down below you guys or whatever, you know, and I, I already know how to fish and this, I'm like, cool, man. So I'm just hanging with his wife or whatever. And, you know, we're, we're catching fish, high five and looking down and he's slapping the water, you know, and she'll say, you might, you might want to go help him out a little bit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you know that too, you know? But on the other hand, you know, that is like the dream come true. Like if, if you have yeah. been trying to, to take your wife or girlfriend or, or friend yeah. or anyone that you're, your kid fishing. And it's been a frustrating experience for both of you. And the next thing, you know, some guide is showing them a great day and they're catching more fish. Personally, that would be chief celebration. I mean, I'd be all about it right then because yeah, finally sure. it happened, right? Like you understand now you're seeing why I like this so much because you're having the success. That would be the ultimate, but not everybody sees it that way. Some people are like, Oh man, yeah. Now I'm getting upstaged by, by the one person that I thought I could outfish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Good stuff. So God, yeah. tell me about, um, tell me about starting out and getting in your, in your first ska band. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, growing up in uh, Ventura, California, um, you know, living on the beach, I was a surfer kid kind of grew up in the, uh, kind of like the punk ska reggae kind of, vibe scene back, back yeah so then. for somebody that doesn't know music as well as maybe you or or fortunately i, I do know what most of those yeah. are like give me some yeah. examples of ska and and like what your maybe some some influences or somebody that somebody might know yeah. so they understand the the type of music so, we're talking about so ska is kind of like uh i always kind of explain it's kind of like a more upbeat reggae and their bands like modern bands now that were influenced by um, ska are like Sublime and No Doubt, uh, Mighty Mighty Bostones, those kind of bands. Um, all those folks are the same age as me. Mm. Uh, and I've uh, been played with those bands myself. But you have uh, played with those bands? Sublime? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, we, well, 
he opened up for him basically. Well, I, I would checking out some of your stuff on your YouTube channel. You're an extremely accomplished musician. And, and then we're going to talk about having uh, some record deals and stuff like that. But um, I mean, really like you're just kind of passing it off that you have this band called the Stoneflies, and you just, you know, you play a little music here and there, but you played music at an incredibly high level. I mean, and certainly to, to open for those bands or to play with some different bands like that, that's, that's, yeah. almost as far as you can take it yeah well um so yeah going back to uh you know playing with uh you know seeing those bands what was really cool back in the day when i was in high school and stuff you know there was bands like the specials mm. the english Beat, um all these bands that uh that we enjoyed back then um even as kids um you know later on in life i got to play with them as well you know <laughs> so there's like bands that had Holy loved and got to meet them and play with them, which was really cool. But our influence, um, me and my friends, you know, that played music, were we were influenced by those bands, and we just like we just like that music. We like the the reggae and the ska, even the the '80s punk and stuff like that. Um, so when we started playing together, we just started playing in uh, you know little parties, you know, like uh, garages, and you know, really didn't know how to play all that well, and we just started jamming and uh having fun and next thing you know these parties are getting bigger and um, we're having all these people show up to hear our horrible music <laughs> <laughs> and um you know just having fun and we created a, a nice little following and then we weren't even like 21 and um, we, we got uh, invited to play at this club in ventura <clears throat> and um a little little club and and we still were were not very good um, and, but we packed it and, uh, we packed the club and the club owners sold lots of beer and drinks and stuff and invited us to play there every Friday. So we started playing every Friday and we started learning our instruments and getting better and, uh, you know, learning how to perform and, and all that kind of stuff kind of, um, got our roots growing up in a, in a club, um, right when we were about 20, 21 or so. Hmm. And then we started getting better and we added a horn section and, um, the, the guys in the horn section were a lot better than us. So we started learning more music from them and, you know, how to arrange songs. And, and it was, uh, you know, these guys were like really well accomplished musicians, you know, playing in, you know, really good bands and studio musicians, but they, they were liking the pay because we were packing the clubs and they were getting paid good. So they would, they stayed with us and it was just a lot of fun. And we kind of started playing uh, concerts um and we started getting a bit even bigger following and we started touring up and down the coast and playing bigger shows and uh doing we started doing uh albums and now when you like were doing that. this it was still called the stoneflies or or what was the band were, called kind of a, a um, most of the guys from this uh that are in the stoneflies were from other bands we kind of transferred into other um into the stoneflies but we were a band called uh lion eyes and another one was called Papa Nada, which are all on uh on youtube and stuff as well um the stoneflies kind of have been the latest version of that we've been been together for about 10 years doing that, that stuff but doing fairs and beer fests and stuff like that you know we're old now so we don't like staying up till one or two in the morning or three in the morning anymore so we like doing those festivals you know with, you know getting done at nine o'clock or whatever <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but we have fun you know the whole thing is um for us it's just about writing music and enjoying um, seeing people react to it. Um, you know, we've always written our, written our own songs and, um, you know, seeing people dance to them or react to them or coming up to them, coming up to us afterwards and saying that that song meant something to them. You know, what's really cool is, uh, this happened to me recently, was uh, a couple came up to me and they had two little kids, you know, and they said, um, we met at your one of your concerts, guy, and um, we, we, we've been listening to your music forever. And here's our kids, um, you know, that we have and they love your music, too. And, and you know, how cool is that? You That's know, awesome. they met at our show. They still listen to our music and they, and they have these kids that love our music as well. You know, it's pretty <laughs> neat. that's awesome. So when you're having the success at 21, you know, and, and it's growing and. There's some momentum. I mean, did you think you were going to be a, a career musician at that point? Oh, for sure. You know, we were, you know, when you're that age, you, you know, you, 
I can't do it anymore, but you're partying and having fun and, you know, staying up late and, you know, mixing with all the people. And, you know, you're, it's almost like you're, it's like, they're, you know, afterwards you're partying with all the folks and that creates even more of a, uh, a following and, you know, that come to see you, you know, in, in every town that you're at, you know. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it's a whirlwind. Mm. But yeah, we, we, we were, you know, we got record deals. We had sour record deals. We got sued um you know everything we got sued for a hundred thousand dollars um from a producer you know it's just stuff like that you know that puts a sour taste in your mouth you know just you know all that all the all the music stuff you hear about it it happened yeah to us for sure and then you you <laughs> at, at some point you just decide i don't got to do something else i guess i mean so, what, what where was that point yeah, yeah so we uh, i, I kind of took a break for about 10 years of not playing music because I was kind of soured by by the music industry for a little while and uh so I didn't I didn't play all that much and um and then one day my my bass player wife called me up and she said hey I want to see if I can get the band back together you know um I've got stage four breast cancer oh no and uh we want to do a fundraiser at the Ventura Theater and have you guys play and, you know, raise awareness for breast cancer and all this. And are you in? I said, absolutely. So she actually was responsible for getting our band back together. Um, and we played this theater. This is the biggest theater in, in Ventura. And we sold it out. And it was just a big reunion, you know, after 10 years of not playing. And all these people came to the show. And um, she got up there and, you know, they raised a bunch of money for, for uh, breast cancer awareness and stuff. And um, that got the band back together. And she, about a year later, she passed away, you know, and it was, uh, mm. it was from her that got the, got us all back together. Wow. Playing music, kind of cool. Yeah. And when you, when you get back out there, um, did you, did you just have this feeling like, where, where have this, where has this been? Like, is this, this was the a hole in your life that you didn't realize that you had or like, what was the feeling of playing again after 10 years? You know, the, uh, the feeling of uh, performing in front of folks is, um, I guess, kind of like for me, like catching your first permit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just exhilarating. It's fun. Um, you know, seeing people, you know, laughing and having a good time is probably the best ever. You know, getting back up there. And hearing everybody screaming and yelling and just, you know, singing our songs and stuff is the best, um, <laughs> best feeling in the world, really. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So now you've got the, I mean, I'm assuming in this 10 year absence of, from playing music, that's when you started really fishing heavy and, and getting your shop going and all that, right? Is that, is that yeah, accurate? Exactly. Yeah, I was. I had tunnel vision, man. I was on a mission, you know, everybody, you know, when somebody tells you you can't do something that always motivates you to do more. You right. know? I had a lot of people telling me that I wasn't going to succeed at, um, at fly fishing and opening up a shop. And I just, you know, I had to prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that I love that when somebody tells me something like that, I'm like, oh, okay, we'll see about that. I'm the son. I'm, I'm with that with anything really, you know, I like to, I like to create stuff and, and uh, make make it succeed for sure. Nice. And so now, yeah. at this point in your life, you got both, right? You got the you got the music thing going. You got the fishing thing. You got your schools and your shop and your guiding and everything. Yeah. But the tournaments, you just need to get it back into the tournaments to round out your life. <laughs> I'm, actually doing, I'm actually doing a tournament up at the Delta. Um, it's I was invited to go to. It's a bass and fly. It's called the Coast of Bass and Fly. And it's all these um, bass fly anglers are, are doing this tournament. And there's like, I don't know, 60 boats or something like that. It's only a couple of days. Hmm. So I got uh, got permission to go for go to that one. So <laughs> that'll be fun, I guess. I'm right? going to go do that. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So it's, uh, it's on the Delta, which is an amazing fishery, you know, by the San Francisco area up there. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard that's yeah. you could go back in there for a lifetime, kind of like the the Louisiana Delta was at one point where that just, you could just continue to go back in there and explore and there's nooks and crannies in there that have never seen a lure before. That's what my friend that fishes there told me. Like it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. 
But yeah, to, to, you know, what's cool about music, I'm going to pop back to music for a second. You know, music nowadays, like when we write songs, like my, uh, my co-writer um, friend lives in Ventura. I live, you know, three hours away. So we're just communicating via the internet. So we write songs through the internet, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And so we, we can go back and forth and then we'll go to the studio and we'll, we'll actually record them, you know. But uh, it's kind of neat to be able to do it that way. And then, the, you know, being able to do videos. I like the whole aspect of not performing so much, but I also like doing videos, mm-hmm. you know, you know, that creating that concept of what the video is about or whatever. Just having fun doing that stuff, you know. Yeah, that's cool. You know, when MTV yeah. first came out, like, I remember yeah. waiting for the first video, which was, do you know what the first video was? I'll take a guess. Let's see. Uh, uh, Duran Duran. Uh, I don't think it was Duran Duran, but it was uh, it was video killed the radio star. Oh, okay, was that was really? the first video, right, on MTV. Yeah, that was the first video oh, on MTV, right. and uh, it was almost like it was planned, you know. Like, um, but I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that's I'm pretty sure maybe I'm not. I'm pretty sure that was the first video because that was about the right time frame, and I'm pretty sure that was it. But then anyway, there was that whole era of like there was a new album coming out and there was a video and it was like the video was huge, man. And we used to sit around and watch MTV. Oh yeah. I don't know where that went or why that, that went away because that was such a good idea. I thought, and maybe it just wasn't a moneymaker for the network or whatever. I mean, that's probably what happened, but man, they had those crazy videos. Like there was that, that one super early on MTV, like aha. And they, it was all in, It was all in yeah. drawing and like, yeah. oh my God, they put a lot of work into that. And it they just played it over and over. And like U2 was on there a lot. And um, Michael Jackson had his videos. Like, I mean, there were just so many iconic videos where I think of Michael Jackson, the first image. Well, I mean, maybe not the first image that comes into my mind, but I think about, you know, like the, the, the beat it video. Like yeah. that was insane. The way he was dancing and the costumes and the whole thing was going on there. And it was huge production and lit perfectly. Yeah. And just like a movie, like you were watching yeah. like a movie. And what about uh, you? Did you get into the, the ska stuff back in the day? Well, I liked, uh, I liked the specials uh, a lot. Um, oh, okay. Because I, I, got, I, I think I told you earlier, but my sisters are, a, a good bit older than me, like about eight and 10 years older than me. So like the influences that my friends had around them, showing them what music to listen to and hearing what your older brother or older sister was listening to was different than mine. Like I had a whole kind of almost the whole musical generation above getting pushed down to me. Like this is the music that they were listening to in the bars. This wasn't the music that they were listening to on the radio. And so right. the specials and, reggae and and all of that i was exposed to and uh and and liked it i liked the specials for some reason i just thought they were awesome and then i got into the punk thing and like them like the punk and i kind of wonder today like why don't we have more anger in today's music like from young <laughs> from young people like you know man we just had like angry yeah. youth and, and it yeah, was like this true. rage and then it was right. then there was rage that went into that went into um into grunge and then it just seems kind of like now it's just kind of like where'd the rage go there's, <laughs> there's no more rage like now it's like bebop and like i don't know everything's super happy and i like happy i'm a positive guy but you know there's yeah. some intensity in in a lot of that music that just doesn't seem to exist right yeah. now or maybe i'm listening to the wrong music but um i don't know i like i like all kinds of music i really do there's only there's only a few types of music that i really just don't like and it doesn't mean that it's not good music it just yeah. does not doesn't do, do it for you. anything for me and and i just i don't know i don't even really want to say it on here because i'd probably lose about three quarters of the viewers that that like love that kind of music but it yeah. i just can't i just can't do it it's just too yeah. cliche um yeah. and it's it, uh, it's the new country right yeah. like now i love country music Waylon yeah. Jennings, Willie Nelson, Sturgill Simpson. He's new. Love him. 
fantastic. But then there's this, this, there's just this other that is just seems to be canned and, and reproduced and it doesn't matter who's singing it. It all sounds the same to me. And it's all about, and I grew up in the South too. So it's all about pickup yeah. trucks and, and drinking beer. And it's like, yeah, can we, can you write a song about something else? Like, I mean, I don't know. That's just the only, I could pretty much listen to the, 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 the chipmunks backwards and enjoy it more than, than some of that. But anyway, that's so like when I, when I moved from Ventura, you know, being in the surf culture and reggae and ska and stuff, you know, moving up here is a completely different, uh, musical taste. You could say, you know, very country up here and mm-hmm. bluegrass. Uh, yeah. Which I, love. I love bluegrass. Yeah. So they have these big concerts in the park and uh, we'll, we'll play these you know concerts in the park in July and the whole town comes out and there's a few thousand people there and stuff like that. So they asked us to play one year. And I remember all the, the musicians from up around here were here, were at our show at the park. And afterwards they were like, guy, you know, what kind of music is that? <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> you know, it was really, it was really cool. But re- interesting in in uh, in this area, you know, we have Bakersfield, which they say is the West Coast Nashville, right? They have Buck Owens Crystal Palace, uh-huh. right? Yeah, yeah. And um, they have uh, Merle Haggard grew up in in uh, Bakersfield, White Yoakum, you know, these guys, and and there's this whole country culture in Bakersfield that's amazing. And that's when I started kind of you know checking out you know the old school country yeah. too. And you're right, you know, the Dwight Yoakum and Merle Haggard. I mean, those guys. First of all, yeah. I saw Dwight Yoakam in concert in, in a small theater and it was only about maybe four years ago. And dude, he rocked it, awesome. rocked it. And cool. he is, he is not, he's one of those guys that, you know, and, and there's so many true professionals out there, but he's not only ha- has a lot of songs that you recognize and maybe not, you don't even realize that, you know, all the words to them, but you do. And, yeah. and it's very familiar but he's also a great entertainer. He puts on a great show and he's, it's obvious that he's spent lots of time doing it because he is, he's a true pro and you could go to a Dwight Yoakam concert and be kind of like, I think I remember who this guy is and come away and be a real fan. Like that's, Mm -hmm. uh, there was another one that, that always stuck with me that I saw. Um, um, Oh God. Uh, 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 John Cougar, Mellon Camp, right? I wasn't a John Cougar fan at all, at all. But I got tickets to this show, and they were really up front, close, and uh, and it was when he had the 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 scarecrow. Um, he was doing all the farm aid stuff, and he was super passionate about it. And I go to this concert, and I came away, and I was like, you know, I still don't really like him his music that much, but that guy is amazing. And he is a fantastic entertainer and he he just, he just won me over. Like there's so many entertainers that are like that, that they, that if you give them a chance, they will blow you away. I mean, they're up there for a reason because they're awesome, right? Like they're good at what they do. And, and I don't know, there's just been several where you, several shows that you go to and you're just kind of, or I go to, and I'm just kind of like mediocre on them and I come away a big fan. That's, that's a great experience. That really is. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. I was I was that way with U2. I wasn't a real big U2 fan. And somebody got tickets and I went to the LA Coliseum to, to see him. You know, I'm like, whatever, you know, I'll go check it out. And then I was just blown away by the way that uh, Bono controlled the crowd. Yeah. I was like, wow, that yeah. is unbelievable, you know. Just that kind of stuff, you know, just the yeah. showmanship, and, and I then I became yeah. a fan. There's like, more to yeah. it, man. I mean, you might yeah, not yeah, like their yeah. stuff on the radio, but you go see them live, and they're they're fantastic. And I always heard people say that, like, yeah, but you should see them live. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I mean, and then I think about the ones that I would have loved to have seen live, like Led Zeppelin. Like that would yeah. have been, that would have been awesome. The Who back in the day, if you didn't get trampled, mm-hmm. um, you know. Like, <laughs> I was telling my son about that. He just discovered the who. And I was like, he's like, man, do you ever listen to the who? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, he was like, well, they're really good. Right. Like, it's not just me. Right. I'm like, yeah, the who was so good 
that people yeah. died at their concerts. Like people would storm the stage. And he was like, really? And, and cause, yeah. cause I think when he, when we were talking about this, there was that Travis, uh, uh, what, what was that concert where they, they recently people, people died at this, uh, uh, Travis Scott. Right. I think yeah, and, and it was yeah. unfortunate, but he had never heard of that happening, you know, in his lifetime. Like dude, that's happened a lot. And, um, it happened back in the sixties, you know, like people would storm the stage and then they used to have just, just, uh, uh, general admission and you just go wherever you just stand wherever. And now it's like, you have all the seating and you have to sit in your seat and all this stuff It's because people got trampled and hurt and, and you'd get smashed up against the stage. And, and, uh, you know, he was like, Oh, I didn't know that, but yeah, the who, and then, yeah. then we started looking at videos of like, Pete Townsend like sticking his guitar in the amps and smashing yeah. everything. And he was like, Whoa, that's what I'm talking about. Like there's some anger there. There was some rage and some anger right. and some passion. And, and, uh, that was, a, that was just a cool, cool time. Um, isn't it cool? Isn't it cool to like, you know, when your kids, they discover, you know, our, our old music, you know, and they're actually like, they, they think it's cool. Yeah. Um, recently my daughters we were you know when, when we're cruising in my truck and going somewhere or something i'll put on hey this is this is uh led zeppelin and this song's called stairway to heaven and then they'll be like wow yeah that's really cool you know and yeah this is or maybe they say is, now how long is this song when is this gonna end yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, when yeah, is the uh, drop gonna happen <laughs> or like free bird you know from yeah from winter you know how long is this song dad yeah <laughs> well we're gonna drive all the way to the hardware store and back and it's still gonna be playing <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. awesome so, awesome yeah. man well well we'll uh we'll probably bring this to a close here um guy how can people um find your stuff go to your schools um yeah. go to your fly shop fish the current with you all the different things that you're offering Best way to, to check us out is go to our website, which is kernriverflyshop.com. Um, you can also find us on uh, YouTube as well, which is my my YouTube channel, which is Guy Jeans. Um, or um, you can go to Instagram, which is at Kern River Fly Shop. Check us out there. We're always putting up fishing reports and our dates of our schools and that sort of thing. Um, but the best way is uh, kernriverflyshop.com for sure. Okay. Awesome, man. It's great to, great to chat with you. It's going to be, yeah, uh, we're going to do a, we're going to do another podcast. So you're going to interview me on your podcast. So you guys can check that one out too, but, uh, definitely check out guy and what he's got going on with Kern river fly shop and, uh, go to his school. If you're a California person, then, then, uh, you've got a great resource there to learn more about fly fishing and do some really cool fishing for carp all the way to, uh, trout. So cool. Awesome. All right. Thanks, bud. That's it. We'll see you. Bye, bud.